Not quite on YouTube yet. Okay, up and running. Okay, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. It, welcome to the Special Board of Education meeting and open session workshop. Um, today, we're going to um, uh, get an update on reopening schools. We'll talk about the Board Safety and Security Ad Hoc Committee and get that approved tonight. And then we'll move into the employee handbook and have an open discussion amongst the board and um, hear a presentation from the administration on it and then we'll adjourn. Um, so let's go ahead. Um, first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. I move to approve the minutes from the special meeting and open session uh, dated July 13, 2020. Second, Nikki. Second. Second, Nikki. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, aye. 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 Any, Julia? Julia, your advisory vote, sorry. Aye. Okay, all those in favor, aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Update on uh, reopening schools, hand it over to Jane. Thank you, Gloria. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a brief update tonight because we have a presentation scheduled for the board on August 3rd. Um, the team that's been planning for reopening has been working throughout the summer months um, in sessions ranging from two full days a week to daily sessions on some weeks. And uh, we've been working really a lot of hours to determine the best direction for MMSD in the fall. During that time, we've been in constant communication with public health, Madison and Dane County, the city, the county, UW health personnel, and statewide groups like PPI, the five largest school districts, and the local Dane County school districts as well. So we've all been trying to work through um, the plans um, together and sharing um, information about the guidance and, and what different school districts are planning. So our guidance has has been and will likely remain at a high level and also changing on a frequent basis based on the status of the virus in our community. One factor that led us to make the decision to go virtual for the first quarter was in fact the changing nature of guidance in response to this changing nature of the virus and the complex nature of meeting guidelines for safe reopenings and buildings. The facts are that our decision was the culmination of countless hours of work by the planning team, um, engaging in research, analyzing data, monitoring trends, which we're continuing to do, and engaging in conversations and st with staff and families and surveys, which we are continuing to do that as well. Um, so we knew that this is going to be a burden on our community, and it weighed very heavily on our minds. Um, we knew that um, in-person learning is always best for our students. Um, and it's our goal to get um, students back in person as soon as it is possibly safe. So um, we are continuing to plan for the hybrid model, which we feel would will be uh, come into play at some point when uh, conditions change. And then um, also um, we are, you know, we'll continue to explore, you know, other options. Um, it could be bringing in um, grade level bands, at, you know, phasing in students uh, uh, over grade levels over time um, or some other models that, that come forward. But for sure, we'll um, be spending our time now really focused on getting our virtual instruction stronger. We've had, um, we've gotten information, feedback now from families and students and staff about what went well what needs to strengthen and change for our virtual learning. And so that's what we're gonna be spending our time on. Um, also, um, we are looking at a possible calendar change so that we can add some professional development days up front for our teachers. Um, again, we're keeping um, rigorous standard aligned 
instructions in place, um, content knowledge that is necessary to support high levels of student learning and also um, engagement and relationships with students will be really important um, as we plan for the reopening of schools. Um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. If you have any questions or areas that you would like the administration to include or look into as we plan further, um, please feel free to let Gloria know or, or let us know and we'll, um, we'll continue to, to take a look at whatever is of interest to you uh, in particular and what you hear from families um, and our community. So I'm gonna leave it at that and uh, any, any um, for that update? Um, any questions, uh, comments, concerns, um, Ali? Yeah, Jen, I wanna thank you for your continued leadership throughout this. And, you know, I wanna acknowledge all the work you all did in March to get us to virtual learning um, and, and cheer you on as you do all the work it'll take to, to get us started this next semester. So um, I fully support the decision, obviously. And I, I think that you have led with a tremendous amount of integrity through an incredibly difficult time. So thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Ananda? Um, yeah, just a couple. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Ali said it extremely beautifully. Uh, thank you, Jane, and thank you for the entire team for um, making really, really hard decisions in a time with a lot of uncertainties uh, for everyone. I have a, a couple of questions. One is because we just received that, um, we just started talking that at the state level uh, because we are trying to figure out what phase we're going to be at and what is what it means to be in whatever phase does not mean the same as it was anyway. Um, so we are likely to be doing a survey to see if, you know, if schools were to open uh, or if, if, um, if, if we are in a space where we come back to the office, who would want to, who would want to work at the office. So I'm wondering if you have done some sort of, I don't think this this time is the best time to do this type of survey um, because we just had the uptick, you know, we continue to have the uptick uh, 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 of cases, but I'm wondering if we have any data around <clears throat> uh, employee interest in coming to school. Yes. Uh, yeah, you do? Okay. Uh -huh. Is there anything you, do, you can share or is that something that's uh, going to Well, it's very general. I mean, I, I think like you uh, alluded to, Ananda, our employees' opinions are going to change over time too. Um, and so this was something that we um, asked early on, um, just a very simple who's willing to come back in, who would have to stay out. Um, and I think it was about 20% of our staff would be um, hoping to opt out of you know, coming into the buildings. But like I said, that was early on. So before we would make any right. decisions right. based on that, we would, um, you know, we would want to get current information. 20% yeah. would opt out of being in a building. Mm -hmm. So 80% so, uh, said that they would come back. Right, I think that's right, Andrew. Am I getting those numbers right? I see you here. And that's about right. The uh, thing to keep in mind is a very early uh, survey. So it is something that we uh, would have to revisit. And really, it, it gives you an idea of the trends of the time that the survey was administered. But when it comes down to it, we do need to know each individual's um, situation. So uh, stating a preference to work virtually um, paired with then medical need. Uh, for example, would be something that we would have to investigate on a case-by-case -case and individual basis. But for planning purposes, it's good to know that 20% uh, of our staff, if they had the option, would go uh, virtual only. Um, but again, a very early survey and really one for general trends, um, you know, and not hearing from every staff member, but then also having to have a system in place that would um, investigate um, accommodations for things like medical need. Thank you so much, Andrew.
Um, and thanks for always making sure that we have uh, fingers on a pulse of of what's happening as far as uh, perceptions and opinions for our staff. Um, follow up question. Uh, I know Jane, you mentioned that you've been in conversations with many stakeholders because our entire community is being impacted by you know our our decisions. Um, so I'm curious about what, how far have you done? Ha, how far are you and your team have done thinking around the utilization of the buildings, similar to what happened in the summer in regards to um, childcare, um, in regards to a, a fall camp situation. Um, I know a lot of people have, you know, it's been in a lot of people's minds the the the, the childcare daycare situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly on our radar screen, and um, I think we'll be able to bring you much more information when we come back on August 3rd about that. Um, but we're, yeah, we're learning uh, a lot of things from that and, um, and definitely have that as part of what we're going to look, look yeah. at. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. And so um, the one last thing, Gloria, if, if, I'm, if it's okay. So Jane mentioned the August third meeting, the instruction work group. So we're planning for every instruction work group to have a dedicated time to for the board to discuss, um, you know, the coming back, virtual learning, online learning, all of those things. Um, I, you know, kind of inviting the my colleagues and everyone watching this if there is additional feedback. I know I've exchanged some emails with Julia about how to bring um, students' voice to, to those conversations. I talked to Gloria yesterday about how to bring staff voice to the conversation. So it's, uh, you know, so it really feels like a, a, a community, you know, um, engaging into this really challenging decision-making process. And then, you know, figuring out how to bring families uh, to this fold as well. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ananda, for that. I think that's a great idea. Um, as many voices that we can get to the table um, and to the board, uh, the better for us. Um, and while we're um, transitioning and, and helping um, Jane and her staff um, during this process. Uh, Chris, did you have a question, comment? Yeah, I just had a few more comments and Ananda, um, several of the things I had on my list echo what you said, um, particularly the childcare issue. Um, I think we have no time to lose if we're going to try to leverage community partnerships to um, address the childcare issue, especially for our 4K through third grade students. Um, I think we absolutely made the right decision in going back virtual, but at the same time, I think the equity issues for that age band are gonna be the greatest because parents need childcare and because kids have a very limited capacity to learn on a screen at that age. So um, I think we absolutely need to like focus on how we can work with our community partners to, to, to provide high quality childcare for every child in this district and not just for families that can afford to pay for it out of pocket. Um, I also really appreciate Jane the comment about looking at different grade bands when coming up with a plan to come back to school. Again, 4K through third grade, increasingly the research is showing that um, students in that age group may not um, transmit or contract COVID as rapidly as older students. So we may need a different plan for students in that age group taking into account the needs of our staff as well. Um, just a few other things I would really love to talk about um, when we come back to this topic is um, or our um, did we learn anything from our summer school experience that could apply to a reopening plan? Um, I would love to talk more about, um, you know, I don't know if this would be in the fall or in the spring, but outdoor classrooms and learning as part of a reopening plan. Um, the childcare issue. Um, I would actually like to talk about um, the metrics we're talking about using to make decisions about reopening. There's lots of different metrics we could look at, like rate of transmission of COVID or percent of positive tests or what's going on with community spread. Um, and also just, I think, you know, I think there's an operational side to this too, and um, it gets beyond MMSD and goes into the community, but the availability of testing and contact tracing does, I think, influence our ability to open safely. And I do think 
we probably need to think about having an operations conversation about reopening as well as an instruct, you know, I think multiple instructional conversations is Amanda put out there. I, I really like the idea of talking about this ideally at every instruction work group meeting. Um, That's I how think, it's currently set up, uh, Chris. It's currently currently set up every every work group meeting will have that conversation. Thank you so much for doing that. I think that's a fantastic idea. And um, I think that will provide the community with transparency and communication, and that's great. Um, I think the um, potential June 8th start date is um, right now confusing for parents. Um, the last thing that parents need is more uncertainty in their lives. So the sooner we can come to a decision about that, the better. Um, also, I. I'm a little bit concerned with how well it's gonna sit with parents that we're taking another week out of the school year to do professional development. If we're going to do that, I think it would need to be combined with some kind of community and family outreach um, to families to make sure that they've got online access to see how their kids are doing, to like start that, um, that staff and um, family communication channel that's gonna be even more important if we're online. So, um, you know, we could do ready, set, goal conferences online, but I think it needs to be, if we're going to not have instruction that week, I think there has to be contact with families and children during that week, or, um, you know, it's going to be confusing to the community why we weren't ready to get up and get started on June 1st. I think we need to think about that. Um, I would love to get more details about how much synchronous versus asynchronous learning we're going to be doing and what's going to be happening with um, electives and specials. Um, as we move into virtual learning. So just some things I'd love to put on the table for um, the next meeting. Great, thanks, Karis. Uh, Nikki? Yes, could we just have also include an update on special and any special ed in that as well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great, anybody else? Um, Chris Gomeschmidt? Yeah, I would just like to echo Chris's um, um, consideration of the the metrics and the operations side of this for how we're making the decisions about when we are bringing people back. And so really staying on top of that piece and working with public health. And I know that you are already doing that um, on a very consistent basis and appreciate that. Um, but just making sure that we're pretty clear on the metrics that, that we as a district are using to decide, um, you know, whichever, if we're going back in, in grade level bands or however we're gonna do that, um, just what metrics we're using to decide when it's time to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, Sabian? Yeah, I just wanna echo that we should definitely prioritize bringing back uh, 4K through third grade, um, if nothing else, for some form of in-person. Um, and I wanted to know, is there anything that we can do proactively to encourage parents as much as possible to keep their children enrolled in, in the district? We'll be um, reaching out with en enrollment um, information as soon as possible. I'm not sure if that's quite the timeline yet, but it, co it comes yeah. up soon. Um, Andrew, sure. do you know that? the timeline for enrollment. And we have been talking about multiple ways of reaching out to parents. Now, let me grab a quick calendar look here. Um, our conventional enrollment week is the week of August 17th. But of course, given uh, that we're going about 100% virtual instruction at the beginning of September, it also implies that we would wanna keep families safe by keeping them out of the buildings. So we are looking to do 100% virtual enrollment as well. Um, so verification of address changes done virtually via Zoom, for example. Uh, we're also taking a look at the enrollment application process itself to ensure that everything that can be um, automated and done virtually is done that way. And uh, as far as uh, strategies then for the future in terms of uh, keeping families in the district, um, you know, we have to look at our virtual offerings, um, as I'm sure other school districts are, uh, particularly for the 21-22 school year after things have changed and after we've learned a lot about virtual instruction. So I do think that's part of a looking forward. So that's your current year enrollment process, getting that as virtual as possible so folks don't have to be in long lines out the door at a high school or even one-on-one -on -one in a elementary uh, office and uh, 
push that all online so we can maintain safety. And then for the future, looking at our, our alternatives too, in terms of uh, keeping families interested in the district. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Anata, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, just follow up, um, Andrew. Something that Andrew mentioned made me think. Um, you know, there, there's definitely when people are talking about parameters and what we're basing things. You know, and we talk about other schools and you know different like schools out of the states. I mean, there's there's little there's very few school districts around the state that actually have a large number of students. Most school districts have our medium size, right? Medium to small size. So we are in a very particular situation as well in regards to that. So we don't have a whole lot of school districts to look up in the state of Wisconsin, right? Uh, and the school districts that we are looking up to, they're also, they're struggling sometimes, you know, more than us or the same level uh, than us or have a much larger, a much smaller number of students. So I think it's important for people to understand, to contextualize that, that we are, you know, we are in a unique uh, situation in regards to that. The other uh, thing that I want us to tease out, and maybe that's a conversation for August, is when we talk about uh, virtual learning. So what, so my daughter isn't taking some classes over the summer, and it's mostly through a platform. Um, and I see that as, as, as online independent learning. And she goes, when she has a question, she, she can schedule a Zoom meeting with a teacher, but it's mostly independent. So I think we needed to also tease out, you know, when I, when I think about a, a virtual conference or a virtual learning, I think about somebody, I'm gonna be connected to somebody live telling me something or teaching me something in a way that I can, that's a true way. So I think we need to start teasing out as we're coming to fall, how those different modes of learnings and how does it apply to different classes. It may apply really well for history where you have mostly like readings and essays. It may not apply as well as math because you can't really do math, you know, on your Google platform or on your, you know, Word document, for example, so uh, or Google Docs. So you know that's another. I think we're there's a lot of proxies names that we're using for the ways in which we are teaching and the ways in which we are learning that I would really like for us to tease out as well. And in particular, and I appreciate Nikki bringing this up, that we needed to really call out what's happening for students with IEPs because that adds to the complexity of um, how we're doing instruction. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're, it's, it's so complex and um, Jane and your staff, I think, you know, you are right in the midst of these challenging times and trying to accommodate so many different um, stakeholders. Um, and so I think that it's so important uh, for us uh, moving forward as a board is to really, um, Stay tuned, um, stay connected, and um, and and work with the administration um, on um, what our new reality um, could be. Um, and so, I think Jane. I think for me, what I would want is really um, in the August meeting um, is a talk about how we are engaging our families. Um, in a very intentional way. I don't know if Nichelle has the ability or her team to really do some family engagement around identifying some of the barriers uh, to uh, virtual learning for their families and children and figure out ways in which we can connect um, with community partners to, um, to reduce some of the barriers to virtual learning and um, really hear about what our families are going through and uh, what we're hearing and what we need uh, to, to accommodate them. Um, is there anything else from anybody else before we move on? Great, thank you, Jane, so Chris much. Chris Gomez-Smith has a question. Who does? Oh. Chris Gomez-Smith. 
Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add in, in case this hasn't already been said, but really also taking a look um, when you report back to us next on families that are making transitions or students that are making big transitions this year. So students entering kindergarten, students starting sixth grade, students starting high school for the first time, and what extra support and sort of welcome those students are going to need um, in this virtual environment. Great, thank you. Well, thank all right. you all for that information. That's that's really helpful for us as we move forward. Thanks, Jane. Okay, next um, on the agenda is the Board Safety and Security Ad Hoc Committee. This is a discussion and action item. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, read the motion here and then we'll have discussion and then we'll vote, okay? Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education create an ad hoc committee called the Ad Hoc Committee on Safety and Security, which shall be charged with providing the full Board of Education with options for replacing school resource officers at the four MMSD comprehensive high schools focused on budget and policy recommendations. It is further recommended that the board members, Gloria Reyes and Savian Castro, co-chair the Ad Hoc Committee. It is further recommended that the Board of Education approve the membership and timeline as set forth in the document prepared for the special meeting dated July 20th, 2020. Okay. Um, Gloria, can you get a second, please? I get a second. I second. Chris Carusi and um, discussion. Uh, Chris? Just um, a quick comment. I'm assuming these will be open noticed meetings that we can all go to, but I just want to confirm that. Yes, they are. Okay. And will all the meeting materials be open to the public? Yes. In those board meetings? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ananda? And then Chris? I just wanted to recommend, uh, so we're, we're voting on the the creation of the work group and the charge of the work group, right? I understand the membership, it's it's still being determined, Gloria? Um, we, we are going to approve the membership as well. Um, and if there are any missing people on here um, that we identify after this meeting, we'll bring it forth to uh, the board at a later date. Um, but if you have any recommendations on membership, just um, if you could, we can add that on tonight and vote. Yeah, so I don't know if do I need an amendment for that. Um, how the? How I don't the, think so. I think uh, if you just um, if there's a recommendation of a board member or uh, committee member. Yeah, so I'd like to recommend the YWCA Madison because they've been doing extensive work with the restorative justice circles for the past twelve years now. Um, so um, I, I would like to recommend uh, Eugenia Highland, uh, who is the director for the restorative justice, but uh, I'll let them decide, you know, like capacity wide, who will be the best person to be serving in, the, in that committee. But that, that's the person that, will, that I strongly recommend to be on that committee. So definitely a YWCA representative, you're specifically recommending Eugenia Highland, um, and, but you'll leave it up to the why. Um, to decide capacity. Okay, we will add that. Um, I think that's an excellent um, recommendation. Um, Nikki, or actually, I'm sorry, Nikki, um, let's go to Chris and then Nikki. Christina Gomeschmidt. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about um, if, if the high schools themselves made recommendations for people to be on the committee. And I was just curious, it, it seemed like we might need one or more two more people from representing East and, and Memorial on there. Um, but I just wasn't sure the process of um, how people, how they were reached out to, um, to be part of the committee. So Mike Hernandez reached out to all the high schools and worked with them. Um, and some of the people here represent more than one lens. So some of the parents are also teachers um, and uh, I think that we can check that for sure for you, Chris. And then if we feel like there's another um, addition, you know, we can find, we can figure that out. But I think there's a double 
West parent and East teacher, at least one that I know of. Okay, yeah, some clarification on that would be great. Okay. So, so your def your your Christina, your recommendation is having an East High, making sure we have an East High representative. Um, yeah, and and Memorial too. Yeah, I think we have one for Memorial. I'm just I'm just not sure. I I understand the desire to keep this smaller, but just to make sure that across all the four high schools that there's a couple people from each. Okay, East and Memorial. Yeah, I just I yeah. Yep. Okay. Nikki? I don't have anyone specific to name right now, so I can't do that for you tonight. But um, that yeah, that was just my suggestion. Okay, Nikki, and then Ali. I would like someone from uh, the disability com community, either from the two groups I'm familiar with, our special ed advisory committee and Madtown Mamas, and either one to have a representative from one of those committees to represent special ed interests because I think it's a unique security challenge to make sure things are accessible as well, especially when we're um, going to be doing a referendum uh, with new construction, there are different security issues with individuals with special needs. And I think that is uh, necessary. I don't have some, the, those are the two people I had in mind. So um, were those, um, did you have a specific people or just- uh, Martha, Martha, Schre I I, bit, I butcher her name. Yes, okay. thank you. And the other one would be um, um, either, Anna doesn't have time, so probably Margarita Rubio is the other one from, She, I think she's in uh, special ed advisory. I may be wrong. I lost track of who's on there anymore. Those are both great recommendations. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Ali? Yeah, uh, I wanna thank you and Savian for doing this work. I think you all will be a really dynamic duo in having this conversation with our greater community. Um, I really support Ananda's recommendation to involve the why and restorative justice. Um, and I think we need to look to alternatives to exclusionary practices as a real kind of guiding light to this process. And so I think examining in-house everything that we're doing to avoid exclusionary practices as a response to student behavior um, is, is an important part of this process. The other thing I said I've, I've talked about before is that I think that this uh, committee should be both safety and security and disproportionality and discipline. Often when we talk about uh, safety and security, we talk about our fears. And when you talk about disproportionality and discipline, you have to talk about facts. Um, right. So we we know that certain students are being overrepresented in, in every level of discipline from 4K throughout their education. Um, and we we need to be committed to in addressing that um, and engaging students in meaningful ways while we do that. Um, and so I think it's important that we, we have the right people at the table. Um, and I agree with Chris. I think it's important that that be inclusive. And I think that that means including uh, a wide range of students who navigate a wide range of identities themselves. Because uh, I think it's great to have folks who speak two issues and two identities. Um, it's also really helpful to have mm -hmm. folks who live in those experiences. And I think that our students have a lot of different perspectives that can be offered. Great, thank you, Ali. Ananda? I just wanna clarify, because I really appreciate what Ali said. Uh, I, I think the language matters. So I'm not sure, were you suggesting to add language to how the ad hoc or to change the language? So my suggestion is that the ad hoc be called safety and security, disproportionality and discipline. I, I'm, I second that. Okay, great. I think, um, yes, yeah, definitely we can do that. Um, who is next? Oh, uh, Julia. Um, I just wanted to ask if there would be an opportunity for students to be part of the committee. Um, both students who may have been affected by SROs in the past um, and pushed for them to be uh, like pushed out with more restorative options, as well as students who might be worried about their safety or who relied on SROs in the past. I think like Ali was saying, putting students into a part of the committee or at least having opportunities for them to um, come to meetings and voice their opinions would be 
um, helpful in driving compliance, especially because they've been the ones who have been most impacted by this in the past. So having um, um, students, um, if uh, Julia, if you have any recommendation or anybody else on this board um, that we can bring forward to the board um, at our next meeting for approval, um, just send uh, me and Jane and Savion an email. Uh, that would be very helpful. Otherwise, um, I think we'll work with, Savion and I will work with Jane on identifying um, some students. I can also go through Student Senate and see if we have any in mind. So thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Chris, did you have, Chris Carusi, did you have something? Um, just a couple things. Um, the first one is because we're not actually going to have in-person school before October 30th, does that change the timeline? So I think um, that's a good um, question, Chris. I think um, we can go ahead and keep the timeline for August. Um, and I do foresee that we'll probably um, may extend uh, the work of the committee um, further out, um, but we won't know that until we get closer to August. But I think that really does uh, force us to keep on that timeline and get as far as we can. And then we report back out um, to the board um, for an update on August 31st. And um, one of the reasons I asked that is that, um, you know, if, if we go with the suggestion to broaden the charge of the committee to also include disproportionality and discipline, we may need more time um, to make sure that we have we give um, due time to all parts of the conversation. So um, I just wanna make sure we have enough time to have the conversation about everything we need to talk about, so. Great. Yep, I agree. Um, Savian? Um, you know, as long as we keep Justice Mitchell on there, I'll be happy. Um, but I am working with, uh, trying to get someone from the, UW Health, a pediatric unit. Um, I don't have a specific name, but I have reached out to a few people there. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so it sounds like we have some good recommendations of, of uh, individuals um, to um, add to the list. We will bring those um, individuals back um, to a, the, our next um, board meeting for approval. Uh, we will add the disproportionality in discipline uh, as part of the title of the safety and security. And um, uh, we will consider, Chris, the timeline on um, August 31st. And I think that the committee can um, have a discussion on that um, and then come back to the board um, with whatever the committee feels is appropriate timeline. Um, to have that conversation and to do that work. Anything else? Okay, all right. Well, um, so the process, um, Savion and I will meet with um, Jane, Mike, um, uh, and really just sort of plan this out and figure out who from administration and staff we need at these meetings. Um, Savion and I will both facilitate um, these conversations. And again, um, all of you, you know, are invited to attend when you can um, to give input um, uh, on this work. So uh, if there are no other questions, we can go um, or comments, we can go for a vote. Um, Julia, your advisory vote. Aye. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. All right, next item on the agenda is the employee handbook. Um, so a lot of um, conversation around this, um, the recommendations, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it to Jane, hand it over to Jane to give us a presentation um, and then we'll um, have a discussion amongst the board. Okay, thank you, Gloria. Um, I just want to clarify, there's no presentation tonight. I'm going to have some remarks and then we'll open it for you guys to discuss. Um, but you do have uh, a memo detailing 
all the recommendations and the supporting documents um, that were sent out on Friday. So one thing I'd like to highlight is that the handbook review committee was able to reach consensus on numerous items that were up for discussion. There are only two items on which the parties were unable to reach a consensus. Today, as you consider making these changes to the handbook, one thing to keep at the center of your thoughts is that these changes are essential to ensure the highest quality and most diverse staff are in classrooms with our children. It's important to note that the administration's recommendation does not eliminate seniority as a criteria. Rather, it adds other criteria in addition to seniority. A policy where layoff and surplus are based solely on seniority is not giving our children the results they need. I know firsthand that the vast majority of our staff are highly qualified and valuable professionals. And I also know that using seniority only as a criteria for surplus and layoff often results in our children losing the benefits of having the highest quality staff because some of our newest hires, and they're not necessarily less experienced, have demonstrated that they are also some of the most effective in our classrooms and providing the best outcome for our students. Because of seniority, there have been several circumstances where we have had no choice but to remove high performing staff for those who have not performed at the same level. We've worked very hard towards increasing diversity in our staff to improve outcomes for our students. And over time, our placing seniority as the sole discussion point in surplus and layoff has evolved into a measurable structure of racial in inequity that runs counter to our com commitment to dismantle such structures. We must live up to our commitment to our students to continue to review existing policies and procedures that interfere with our progress on fighting racism within our educational system. Our students need your help on this issue and the time for changes is now. With students at the center, we must create processes that treat all teachers the same with the same opportunities to maintain their jobs based on the quality of their work with our children and not simply longevity. Should longevity be held in high regard? Absolutely. However, longevity does not reflect high quality in some cases. The rubric in our proposal, which MTI has agreed to work with us on, includes these criteria, instructional practice, cultural competence, previous experience, academic credentials and certifications, second language proficiency, as well as seniority in the Madison District. Our recommendations on handbook language are the results of conferring with MTI and others and represent what I believe are the right moves for MMSD. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe strongly in this work. Finally, I want to clarify that the layoff process is only used if we have to reduce force. It doesn't happen often and is not the same as the ongoing evaluation and accountability process that might take us to a non-renewal. We would not use the layoff process to remove someone for low quality performance. Also, it's okay if sometimes we don't reach consensus with MTI. That happens, not very often, but sometimes it does, and we still continue to work together. We need this decision sooner than later because of the nature of our finances. It is the financial responsibility of the board to look carefully at all of the options we will have and make decisions that will protect the financial well-being of the district. As a steward of public finances, it would be irresponsible for us to continue to pay people who may not be needed to deliver on essential services for our children. This is not something any of us look forward to, but we need to have as many options as possible in the times that we're living. We do not yet know our staffing plan for the fall and we need to plan responsibly. We need to keep the 30 day notice or we could only reduce force in the spring. We need the flexibility to act sooner rather than later if this is necessary and this would give our employees enough time to plan and be financially beneficial for the district. We would recall people if that situation would occur, we would recall people as soon as the situation changed to support that. Dr. Jenkins and I have talked about this and I am moving this recommendation forward and I believe he is in appreciation of that. 
We talked about the pros and cons of this, and I continue to think this is the right recommendation to move forward, and he is appreciative and supportive of me moving this language forward. I will now open it up for your discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really wanted us to, um, this, um, as you recall, um, I requested that we postponed um, a vote on this um, because I felt that it was important enough for the board to have an open discussion about this so our community can um, hear us speak and our thoughts around it and hear from Jane um, on where she was at and why uh, she was bringing this forth um, to us uh, for a decision. And so uh, this really gives us an opportunity uh, to speak on this tonight. And um, we do have it scheduled for a vote on the 27th. However, if um, the board feels uh, that we are prepared to do a vote tonight, we can go ahead and do that. Um, if a motion is um, placed um, on the table uh, this evening. So why don't we go ahead and open it up for a discussion? Uh, and um, I'm I stretching. Sorry. <laughs> I was stretching. I'm withdrawing my hand. I was just stretching. I had your tendonitis in my fingers. Okay. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to, um, any questions or comments, Ali? Yeah, so I think that uh, we'll, we'll all speak to this because it is a, a sincerely important change. Um, Jane, I, I wanna thank you for the work that you've done with MTI and the whole team that's worked with MTI um, to make a lot of decisions um, that, that allow for us to work together better um, and ensure that the highest quality educator is the educator in front of our kids because uh, that's the priority. Uh, I have heard a lot from, you know, trusted friends and community members and educators that I have loved for a very long time um, that are deeply critical of, of this decision. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, in campaigning for school board, I've heard every single one of my board candidates or my board colleagues uh, talk about wanting to have a more diverse faculty. And the truth is, we're not going to get different results by doing the same thing. The phenomena we are trying to address with this language is that people of color are the last hired and the first fired. Now, we can't do anything about the fact that folks have been the last hired for centuries. Can't go back in time and change that, but we can change that folks are the first to be terminated. Um, and so that is what we are trying to reconcile. And it is a necessary thing to do. We want to ensure that our young people uh, have high quality diverse educators um, as, as the guides through, through their education. So I think that this is a very important decision and I appreciate Gloria, your thoughtfulness in giving us space to have a, a deliberate conversation. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Julia? Um, I just have a few questions I'd like to go through if whoever knows the answers would like to answer. I'd appreciate it. Um, the Julia, thing, can I ask you to uh, get a little bit closer to your mic, please? Can you hear me? Hi. Hard to hear you. Thank you. Wait, I'm going to stop my video for one second. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Great, thank you. Um, so my first question was just for the cultural competency criterion. Is there, do we know how that's going to be measured? Is there any objective way of measuring that? Or is it down to the discretion of the principals? I'm going to ask um, Deirdre or Heidi to talk about that a little bit. For all of the criteria that are listed, um, what the plan would be would be that we would work together with MTI collaboratively to create a rubric for measuring um, each of the criteria. And if you um, were able to look at the materials that went out on Friday, we actually kind of put a sample in there it's you know totally a sample but just to give an idea of what we were thinking about when we'll be looking at creating such a rubric okay um and then also i'm curious what's causing mti so like you're saying we would work together with mti to create a rubric that seems fair but 
I've gotten a lot of emails from teachers who are concerned about the objectivity of, of cultural competency and more specifically the educator effectiveness overview, which I think that already exists, right? So what's causing them to be concerned about that? I really can't speak for them as to what their concerns are because there already is a rubric in place for the educator effectiveness system. So yeah, that would be something they would need to give you more specificity around. All right, and then also, so has seniority in the past acted as an incentive to keep teachers within the district? And can we expect that in the past it might have mitigated turnover? Like, do, do we have any reason to think that in getting rid of seniority is a chief way of, uh, like, is of protecting teachers' jobs that that would lead to any increase in turnover? I mean, I, I don't know that we know that for sure, but I would be, I do not think that getting rid of it would lead to more turnover in staff. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great questions, Julia, thank you. Anyone else? Um, Nikki? Yes, um, the studies that, I, uh, that I've read that are not MTI, because I've researched this actually quite a bit, did show a mixed bag. And it did show that at the start in certain areas, teachers did um, actually leave. It depends on the economic climate along with it. I am. I'm going to be blatantly honest. I am all for forming the rubric. I think it's a great idea. And I think we should work with MTI. I think the non-starters for me is the employee layoff unilateral decision and the 30 days and that's where I get stuck. If someone does an amendment, I'd be glad to support it. Yeah, I think Nikki, um, I think that that is um, where uh, my concern is. I think with any um, equity work um, with what we're trying to do here today. I think we're all on the same page, right? We do want we are, we do want to get to the point where we are increasing diversity of teachers and doing what's best for our students. Um, it's always the how we do this, right? And I think it is um, oftentimes when we are pushing through institutional um, you know, policies that have been in place for years where we get stuck. And um, I think that this policy of seniority is there for a reason and has been there for a reason. And it's to protect our, our teachers um, and our staff um, and very valid, right? I think that it, it plays, a, it plays a, a critical role in the safety net of our employees. And um, however, my frustration throughout this whole process has been why we cannot um, come up with a solution. MTI has continued to talk about um, equity and they're um, wanting to work on equity and um, the administration has as well. And it, the frustration uh, for me has been why there can't be a solution um, that has been um, negotiated between the administration and MTI. Um, because from my standpoint, it, it, it feels as though we all want the same thing. Um, and we're letting seniority um, get in the way and causing this narrative of um, union busting or not wanting to take care of our teachers and our staff. And um, it, that's not the case at all. I think we all want um, on the board, um, our administration and MTI want what's best for our um, teachers and our staff and our students. And um, I think that we just have to really come together and um, figure out how we do this. Um, and we cannot continue this narrative out in our community that we are in opposites um, and fighting um, against something that's not true, right? Um, I actually, I'm gonna object there. 
Nikki, because very simply, this is the Nikki, biggest I, power grab since Act 10. I'm please, sorry, but it's you, two weeks before Nikki, a new superintendent that. starts. I do and not, we already did a draft budget. Nikki, I apologize. I, I apologize. I, I cut you off. I yes, apologize. Yes, you're cutting me off. And that's you're uh, right. You're you, right. And I apologize. You can go after me. Deal. I apologize. I, I spoke out of turn. Yes. I respect that. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so I, I really do think that we have to um, figure out how we move forward and work together. Um, and whether people see this as a power grab or, or, or what it is, um, it's not. And we have, to, we have to stop fighting each other because what's, what's happening here is we're really forgetting the important factor here and that is our students. We cannot continue to sit here and fight um, on, a, on a topic here about um, racial equity. When we're all trying, we, when, when every time we speak, we talk about racial equity. We can't say it and not do it. So we have to be able to do it. That is, we, we, this whole city community talks about racial equity, but the minute that we make, try to make any movement towards that, it is, it is um, bringing up a narrative of power grabbing, um, process issues. Um, it, our focus goes to something else, union busting. That's not what this is. We're trying to figure out ways in which we can make our process more equitable for our black and brown staff and students and our male um, teachers. Uh, and so I think we really have to keep an open mind here. Um, and I think that we can come up with a solution, this board can, uh, protecting the rights of our teachers, staff. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the board has, it's landed on our, our feet here. We have to um, lead us through this and, um, you know, I, I don't agree with where MTI is, is, um, is going and why they're not coming up with any solutions. And it's unfortunate that our administration and MTI have not worked together. And now we're, we're in a place where we're gonna have to figure this out. Um, and it's not, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And so um, I think Savion, you had your hand up. And then Nikki, if you still want to go after that. No, I actually, Savion, I want to hear your thoughts. You make me more thoughtful. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I had a few things planned. Uh, I want to commend Jane or Jane and the team and MTI leadership for coming together during this process to find consensus on a number of issues from hazard pay, school calendar, handbook revision, benefits, SSAs substitute teachers, emergency closure. They met and conferred during a global pandemic and found consensus on a number of issues. That's a testament and people uh, deserve to be, um, you know, it, that work deserves to be acknowledged. Uh, personally, um, and I think the research supports this, sen seniority as the sole determinant uh, you know, we should not be using seniority as the sole determinant in evaluating somebody's ability to serve children. And I'm committed to finding a holistic rubric between these two parties. Um, I also understand the concerns over discretion over someone's direct supervisor, and I want to uh, address that. Um, you know, everybody deserves a fair shake. and. Everybody deserves a fair appeals process if they feel like they were evaluated incorrectly. Um, you know, we are dealing with questions over objectivity, but I also don't want us to wade into something that's completely arbitrary as well. We have to wade into how are we evaluating an educator's ability to serve children in the city that has some of the largest achievement gaps in the country. We have to wade into this work and we have to get into it. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak, but I'm ready to introduce a few motions and amendments. Sure, um, we'll do that here shortly, Savion. Um, Christina? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that I agree that, 
changes to using seniority only um, as as the way we decide um, for layoffs, uh, it's, the changes are needed. Um, I was just expecting more time. I mean, I, I hear the narrative, you know, on both sides that we've tried to reach consensus. I just, I didn't expect it to come back to us so quickly. I, I feel like when you are making these big of decisions and trying to make sure that the criteria and the metrics that you use are objective, that it is going to take you more time to work that out and reach that consensus. And so, um, I guess when, you know, for the first time, you know, that we just got on Friday, we see those six criteria laid out. For the first time, we have a sample rubric. And so I really do see us making progress towards this. And so I, I, I don't want the narrative to be that, that this is not possible for us to come together and, and work on this together to get the problem solved. I, I think it's possible. And I just think um, we need some more time to do that. Great, thank you, Christina. Uh, Ali? Yeah, I, I have to speak to the idea that we can kind of exist in a holding pattern when it comes to racial justice or equity work, um, because there are people who can afford to wait and there are people who can't. Um, and Black students have been told and Black educators have told, been told and the Black community has been told over and over again, um, wait a while and we'll figure it out. But until we do, we're going to stick with the same system that doesn't work for you. And that's not an option. Um, I have talked to educators who have real fears, real concerns about this shift in terms of discretion, in terms of uh, you know whether or not things like favoritism or personal conflict will be you know, things that rise to the top of their evaluations or determine their jobs. And at the same time, our black and brown educators, their livelihood is on the line. Um, so who benefits from us making this decision and who benefits from us not making this decision or waiting to make this decision are things we need to be conscious of. Great, thank you. Um, Christina and then Chris Carusi. And I guess I'd just like administration to clarify the timeline that we're working on that that doesn't allow for us to, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we drag this out forever. I'm, I'm suggesting put a deadline on this, but, um, you know, let's have the new superintendent come in and wade into this with us and, um, yeah, help figure this out. Jane? Yeah, I just want to clarify that. Um, we have already agreed with MTI to work on the rubric and that will be done. So it's not that we're not going to have a rubric that we agree on. Um, that's that's going to be worked on. Um, there is a timeliness to this decision. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, we don't know what our reopening model is going to look like, but and we just don't know, but we need to have the flexibility to be able to operate with our budget in, in a financially prudent way. So while this is not the driver of this, it's it's kind of driving the timeline because we need to have some flexibility and it's the right thing to do. So we will have time to work with MTI and how this gets played out um, after the decision is made. Jane, um, Jane uh, I think, so will the rubric come back to the board? Um, I typically don't think it would, but I don't know. Is Deirdre, Deirdre, do you want to? It would have to. Yeah, share? Jane. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Um, Jane, we talked about this early on and we did say that the rubric would come back to an instruction work group. Okay, good. So we agreed that we would work on it and that would be the place for the board to, to weigh in and provide feedback. Great. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, I think, you know, what concerns, um, I didn't hear Savian's point, sorry. What concerns me is um, the 30 day. Um, I think that there are some things on here and then not having the actual rubric um, played out. Um, I think that it, it really con concerns me. I think that having, making a decision like this during this very um, critical time, um, it, it, I'm hesitant. Uh, I think that it is, um, it, it's never good, right? I mean, our, our teachers and our staff are already under a lot of pressure 
um, with COVID. Um, and I, I agree with all the points that um, have been um, discussed here. Um, Ali, your, your points about our black students uh, waiting and you know, all that is totally uh, legitimate. Um, but uh, I just think that passing um, this with not having all the information that we need um, uh, as far as the rubric information, um, you know, the 30 days just really just throws me off. I mean, I can't even imagine working somewhere and only be given a 30 day notice. Um, and so um, that really, really concerns me. I mean, and I've also talked to our, some black educators and some black staff um, who um, seniority for them um, has protected them. I, and um, so we are dealing with some institutional uh, racism within um, public school, our system that um, we have educators, black and brown educators who are, who are at a point in their seniority that they feel protected uh, when they talk or about or speak up on um, racial issues um, happening in their schools, right? They feel protected. And so um, I think that this is one point, one solution, um, but it's not the, the whole entire solution in getting into what we're trying to fix here. Um, is what I'm trying to say here. This is much deeper um, uh, of uh, built into the institu to institutional structure um, of our school district. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, Savion and then Nikki. Yeah, um, so historically, education is a white profession and those voices matter. Um, but if you look up the the chart, you know, the chart of who's been here the longest, it gets wider and wider as you go up. It's certainly like a domino, you know, a domino has a few dots. As you go up, it gets wider. And as you go down in our district, it gets more diverse. And that's what we're trying to talk about here in terms of mandatory reductions in force. I agree 100%. We have to change the culture of our schools for our Black educators and Black students so that they don't experience the microaggressions, the microaggressions and macroaggressions, the pigeonholing um, the lack of support and trust from, uh, from their school buildings or their direct supervisors. We absolutely have to change that and address that. This is not the end all be all. Um, I'd like to clear the deck here. There are a number of things in this that we have reached consensus on. So I would like to, um, I'd, I'd like to move that the Board of Education adopt proposed modifications to the MMSD employee handbook as set forth in the document prepared for the special meeting dated July 20th, 2020, excluding the proposed revisions on teacher surplus slash unilateral reassignment slash layoff and hiring and the support units effective August 1, 2020. Second. Uh, Nikki second. Okay, discussion. Um, so we have a motion on the table. Um, Savion, so I just want to make that make it clear that you um, are proposing that we take out the controversial aspect of what we're dealing with here. And Absolutely, we're everything. taking off the things we have not found consensus on. Yep. Okay, um, any discussion? Ananda, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I've been paying attention to my colleague's position. I'm also paying attention to the rationalization of the conversation. Um, and I'm thinking about what I know about the history of this country, in particular around uh, significant policy changes. And as an immigrant, you know, this is not the, my birth country. So as an immigrant, I'm always uh, really try to approach from a very reflective and respectful manner um, and also drawing from uh, recent literature that both have done research, illustrated and highlight the 400 years of perpetual uh, in inequities that uh, often shows up in policies. And Ibrahim Candy calls uh, the way that he classifies policies, he says there's racist policies and anti-racist policies. 
And when we operate in spaces like um, like Madison, where we raise our flag of being progressive, as we're raising our flag of being this beautiful place to live uh, with great schools, sometimes the policies, it's hard to really tease out where is the racism and where is the exclusions. And I think this is one of those times. Uh, I am 100% in favor of making significant and drastic changes in how we do business in Madison. Um, I really appreciate Ellie drawing back from what we heard in a campaign what we hear, we heard from all the all the fellow board members in regards to diversifying the workforce. This is definitely not a new topic. In 2012, that's what I heard when I launched my camp, my first campaign. And we are in 2020, and not much has changed in regard to policy change. And so I'm also not interested in waiting. Um, I am interested in being really courageous about this. Uh, what the piece that is concerning to me uh, right now, and I appreciate Savian offering some solutions in regards to how we're voting tonight, is um, our inability to have conversations and getting some common ground. I do not think that we're going to get a consensus about this. Um, I don't think that everyone is going to leave like being 100% behind this. This is a major, major dissent area, right? It impacts people's employment, right? If, if uh, DPI one day says, hey, all we're gonna do now is hire black people. And if you're non-black individuals, you may not have safe in your job. As a non-black person, this is impacting me. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to do some soul searching, some thinking, especially when I operate in a structure of, of uh, being a, a against anti-Blackness, right? Um, so I feel like that it, that's a lot of what's happening tonight and what's been happening in our community. What, what, what I struggle with is us coming to the, like get into this, com this the layered conversation, this other layer of conversation around, we don't have a consensus, so therefore we can move forward People, some people not meeting with other people or we did meet and we did not meet and there's multiple stories to the conversation and us not really uh, losing sight to what really what we're doing here, right? Um, so that's the part that I struggle is the multiple stories that are coming there uh, and not really uh, feeling that there's not just dissent, but there is... Um, a great level of, of people feeling that this is a lose-lose situation. That is a really sad place to be because we're really talking about racial justice. We're really talking about doing, doing right. Uh, we're really talking about being courageous. We're really talking about doing something different. We're really talking about disturbing the status quo. And, um, and it's really challenging when we get to the space of like, but so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. And that's really, it's disappointing to hear. So I fully support um, Savian's um, uh, amendment to this. And I do want to figure out ways uh, for us to, to be able to go to a space where maybe we're not gonna agree 100%, but there are decisions that we can live with and uh, figured out ways in which we can make agreements of how we're going to move this forward. Because I think that there is a part of this, the integrity of this process of, of communicating that has been harmful for both sides. And that is not how we want our children to see us doing this, right? That's not how we want this moment to remember. I really do not want this vote to be Black people, brown people voting for, and white people voting against it. I really, I really sincerely do not want that to happen for the sake of our children in this time, in particularly, for my daughter's sake, for Ali's babies, I, for, for Gloria's baby, I really don't want to be a racialized vote. And let's just make this happen, people.
let's make sure that we can get a diverse workforce the same way that we said when we were running for office that we're going to do. And let's make sure that we have that. And in order to do that, it's policy change. We have to stop saying that what we want, how many people we want to hire, how, you know, hold Jane accountable to do that without policy change. We really need to do some policy change. Otherwise, Dr. Jenkins is not, not going to have a lot to work with. Thank you, Ananda. Um, Savion, do you want to, uh, do you have a timeline in mind that you want to put in your motion? Yeah, we should vote on this and then I have a second motion and directive. Okay, so we're still in discussion on the on your initial motion. So, um, Chris, Chrissy. Thank you, Gloria. And um, thank you, Savian. I'm, I'm fully in support of this motion. Let's clear the deck, as you said, and vote for the stuff that everybody has agreed upon. Um, I think um, we can say, um, you know, it's good to start from common ground. And I think everybody on this board is in agreement that we value racial equity and that the status quo is not working. Um, I also want to say that in the hundreds of emails that we've received from MTI members, um, by and large, they are not saying, let's maintain the status quo. They're saying to us, please honor the collaborative handbook process. And I feel that we can honor the collaborative handbook process and take a very strong stance as a board that the status quo is not working and we want to see the handbook committee move forward in a way that will bring more equity into our decisions about staffing and help us achieve our goal of um, bringing more teachers of color into this district and making sure that we can retain them. That's important to every member of this board. Um, with that in mind, or that said, um, I have a few specific parts of the, um, the, the, the proposal on um, layoff and surplus um, that I want to make sure get addressed before we vote on it. And it, it may take some time to address these things and I think we need to achieve consensus on them. The first is the proposed rubric. My understanding is that MTI hasn't actually had a chance to sit down at the table with administration and discuss this and hash this out. I think we need to take the time for there to be staff voice in um, developing a rubric that everybody's on board with. And I firmly believe that this rubric needs to live in the handbook so that future changes to the rubric are part of the collaborative handbook process. I think it's really important that if we're developing metrics by which our staff are measured, our staff have a voice in defining those metrics. Secondly, um, I'm concerned about the appeals process that has been brought to us. The appeals process begins at stage four of the grievance process, which means that there is no staff voice in that process. It basically goes from a suggestion for a layoff to the board being brought that suggestion for a layoff without any kind of um, independent arbiter being brought in. I don't know if it's realistic for there to be an independent arbiter in um, layoff um, appeals, but we need to have a process where before this comes to the board, staff have a voice and staff have a voice when it comes to the board. Um, and finally, I think we need to take out the 30 day layoff notice. Um, Right now, we don't have a budget repair bill on the table. We aren't faced with a financial crisis. Should that come to pass, I think we can do a memorandum of, of understanding or something so that we can act quickly. But I don't think we should do something this drastic without an actual crisis happening. Um, so I do not agree with the 30-day layoff notice. And I think we should not be working that way. Thanks. OK, um, thank you, Chris. Nikki? And um, I was just going to say that, Savion, you've always made me think You've always made me slow down and actually think. And as someone who's hyper and speaks more than thinks, that's actually quite helpful. I 100% agree with um, your changes. I think that the um, that we can work out a situation because the status quo doesn't work, and it's correct. It doesn't work for the disabled. It doesn't work for people of color. It doesn't work especially for individuals who are disabled and of color. It, let alone Native Americans who aren't even on the chart because there aren't, because there are so few. We need to work together. And I think this is a way that we, your suggestions are a way that we can move forward without causing major harm. And I respect you for that. And I thank you for it. Thank you, um, Nikki. Um, so I think that we are, um, it seems like we are in agreement. I'll go to Ali and Julia here in a minute. Um, that um, we all are on the same page, right? The status quo is not working. 
Yeah. Okay. And um, I think the um, I, th I think the message and the narrative that we send out to our community is that we are really moving forward with the focus and a priority around equity. And um, I think MTI needs to understand that this is the direction that we are moving and they have to come on board and work with our administration and team and the board on solutions to resolving this issue, right? This, is, this can't take forever. We have to make a decision. We are giving MTI, our teachers and our staff, our administration an opportunity with this motion to come together and coming up with uh, you know, solutions for us um, on what they want, all right? So we understand um, so we all understand that this is where we're moving, right? This is not about just talking about racial equity and equity within our community without actually doing it. This is an opportunity for the board. This is an opportunity for MTI. This is an opportunity for our community to actually move on something solid. And uh, with Savion's motion here, we are actually going to be able to come to the table and do this, but it's not going to we, we can't take a lot of time. So I'm looking forward to Savion's uh, other motion on timeline on this. And let's move to Ali and then Julia. Gloria, I greatly appreciate you emphasizing that we are getting to the same page. I think the thing is, is that uh, racial equity and, and racial justice um, are great things to pay lip service to. They sound really good and they're very complex things to take action around. And I think, you know, it, it would be one thing to examine this from the lens of what M MMSD is as an employer, but MMSD uh, isn't really tasked with employing people. MMSD is tasked with educating all of our children. Um, and that, that has to be the priority is making sure that we have high quality educators in front of our kids um, and that an arbitrary date doesn't keep a really talented educator from progressing in their career while allowing uh, you know, somebody who, who is not bringing what our kids need to the table to stay in a role that uh, you know, serves, serves them in terms of being employed, but doesn't necessarily serve our students in terms of being served and educated. I think it's a really complicated thing to talk about bringing educators to the table, um, especially in their entirety to advise this process, in part because we do have a majority white workforce. And so asking a group of majority white folks how to bring in communities of color um, and how to include communities of color and how to let go of the benefits of white privilege, um, I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily gonna get us there. And I think any time that we've advocated for the needs of kids of color, it's been a pretty intense thing. When you think about integration of education, it wasn't, it didn't happen via consensus. You needed the National Guard to walk kids to school, right? So these, these, are, these are really uh, in, in, intensely entrenched issues that we're talking about. I greatly appreciate the amendment, Savian. Um, I, I'm excited for us to vote. Um, May Julia, I ask a quick question procedurally, just really um, quickly, I'm sorry. Um, Julia's been waiting. Julia. I'm sorry, Julia. Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the board recognizes the need for racial justice. Everyone, the idea of it always sounds good. And I think also the value of fair teacher employment practices that help students. I really, at this point, don't understand what this policy would mean in practice. I think it sounds vague. And at that point, I really don't know what to think of it or how to vote on it. And I think teachers also aren't sure what it means. And that's why we've seen such concern about it and community concern. I think the only sample provided of a potential rubric doesn't mention racial equity or mention students of color or student backgrounds of any kind. It's just about um, like one of the criteria of academic uh, certification. Be clear here, the, the, the motion that we're talking about right now uh, excludes those two things that we're talking about. I know, about. I know, it is. About, I mean, uh, yes, yes on the motion, excluding those things, but just back on that issue, I just wanted to say, I understand why teachers are concerned and I, I understand why we've received dozens of emails from teachers who are worried about this, I get it. And I can't be sure 
whether this is the best way of accomplishing a better student experience or of retaining more staff of color that represent the students in our district. And I'm not sure if this will hinder more or help more with the student experience because I think everyone recognizes the fact is that students do better when teachers are not, when teachers represent them and also when teachers don't feel like they're adversaries of the district and whether that's a false narrative or not, I, we can't really speak to, but I mean, it does affect the student experience and students do best when they have the best teachers and when teachers have experience in their schools and experience teaching the classes that they're used to. So in other words, when high quality teachers are attracted to the district and when they stay here for a long time. So I am, I am concerned about um, what seniority, getting rid of seniority as a main factor would do for that. And I just, I think it's really vague right now and everyone has good intentions and I just don't know how we can be expected to act on that or how we can expect teachers to be comfortable with something that's that vague. Thank you, Julia. All, I mean, th that was just excellent. Thank you. You brought us all together on this. Um, I think Savion, um, you are, um, your motion is on the table, uh, eliminating the area, the items that we have not um, been able to come consensus on. Um, did, you, did you wanna add anything else to that motion? No. Okay, Okay. let's go ahead and, and vote. Um, all those in favor? Julia, Julia. Savion. Uh, Julia. I'm sorry, Savion, do you wanna read the motion again? Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, we should vote on it. Um, okay. Go ahead. I move that the Board of Education adopt proposed modifications to the MMSD employee handbook as set forth in the document prepared for the special meeting dated July 20, 2020, excluding the proposed revisions on teacher surplus, unilateral reassignment, layoff, and hiring and support units effective August 1, 2020. Okay, Julia. Yep. Uh, Julia, your advisory vote? Aye. Okay. All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay. That's so unanimous. Yeah, unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Now, do you read that with the amendment in? I'm confused. I now have a second motion that I'd like to put on the table. Um, I further remove, move that the Board of Education direct the handbook review committee as set forth in section eight of the MMSD employee handbook to continue meeting on the proposed handbook revisions on teacher surplus, unilateral reassignment, layoff, and, and hiring the support units with the deadline of the with a deadline of the November regular Board of Education meeting. Should the district experience significant funding loss due to state budget cuts, the board may move up the deadline for bringing forward this proposal no later than the November regular Board of Education meetings. Now this will come with a few directives that the handbook Review committee should develop a mutually agreed upon rubric or other objective evaluation tool that will be added to the handbook, develop an appeals process that will provide representation for teachers select for layoff and re remove 30 day layoff notice. A second. Another second. Jerry, do you need to clarify we didn't vote that? On the I, first one. Just, we Nikki. need some clarification, Nikki. So with that motion, Savion, again, that's a motion that is directing staff to do something, which doesn't fit with how motions are made. Motions are simply statements that describe the proposed action or decision. The action you're proposing is not an action of the board. The board can't affect that. You know, most of, if you think about most of the motions that you propose, it's I move that the board approves a contract or the motion that just happened. And in directing staff, number one, you're directing us to do something that we need a, another participating party. And you can't direct that party to participate in the process. So essentially it could fail in you directing us to meet and confer because they don't have to, we don't control them. MMSD has no control over them. I would recommend if that, if you want to give a directive to the board, just as if the board was asking for reports or what have you, just state it, just say, I want to direct the administration to do X and it'll be done. The, the motion has no more force in getting it done than just directing the staff to do it. 
So, so Sherry, we can, um, Savian and I can make a motion directing the superintendent. Um, Correct. Work on, um, so just change the. But again, that's presuming that MTI participates. So it could be one-sided and there's no participation. So we could try. I mean, yeah. that's the best you're gonna. I think that that is, um, I think that that is what Savian's intention is, is um, to direct the superintendent uh, to work with MTI. Um, and then, you know, we'll have to get a report out on how that has worked um, at a later date. Um, but really, I mean, I think it's a good faith effort in working with MTI um, on this, Savian, is that correct? Yep, uh, I, I think, you know, despite, you know, the narrative, we are closer to agreement than would appear. You know, MTI and the district have both agreed in principle to a rubric that goes beyond seniority. It doesn't uh, uh, eliminate seniority, but both MTI and the district have agreed in principle that seniority can't be the sole determining factor. Um, so yeah, that's right. So Savian, I would just change your motion to, Sherry, he can change his motion to um, directing the superintendent. We need to discuss the 30 day piece as well. When? I don't know when it comes. Okay. I mean, can I add a directive that should, uh, should an imminent threat of layoffs appear, the board will reconvene to create an MOU? We have we a handbook, an so an MOU doesn't work okay. in the handbook process. An MOU works when you have collective bargaining. So I think say I think Savion's language is 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 uh, is fine. Um, I think he just needs to change um, the initial um, directing the superintendent. Chris, Savion, can you change that? Okay. So we, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? Um, Ali, go ahead. So, dear Joy, I appreciate that you popped on. Um, I. I'm curious if we don't have the 30 day notice, how much notice do folks get? Um, and because we are facing a budget shortfall, uh, I think, you know, I mean, obviously if you're gonna lay somebody off, it'd be great to give them a year notice. But if we're laying people off, it's because we cannot afford to keep them on, which means if we keep them on for an extended period of time after they've been laid off, um, the, the ramifications, I, I think that that, that that's not in line with our fiduciary responsibility as a board. Uh, Deirdre, can you speak to how much notice we have to give folks before laying, laying them off as of right now? Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really important point and I'll let Heidi jump in here as well. But the, the current language stands that we use the non-renewal process uh, as, the, as the process for reducing force, which happens in the spring, which happens one time a year. So if we don't put in a provision that gives you the flexibility to make some of those shifts when you need to, you will essentially not have the ability to move in that direction and lay off. And, and I'll let Heidi jump in here because she can say it much more eloquently than I can. But I, I think you need to really think about the 30 day notice piece as a way to provide options and flexibility. Um, Heidi, do you want to jump in? So, Dear pretty much said it all, um, right? Because current under the current language, there is one time a year that you look at layoff and that is in the spring and then you're laying off the person for the upcoming school year. So if there is absolutely no change in the language, then that would be the one time during the year when you can look at layoffs. No, so. I have to be really honest. I, I'm deeply concerned about uh, our our ability to navigate resources at this time. Um, okay. I think I think our enrollment is going to be incredibly impacted, and I think that we have to be able to make difficult decisions in this moment, um, given the pandemic. And so I think, uh, you okay. know, yeah. Uh, Ali, just process wise, we've already approved the uh, Savian's initial motion. Um, I have a legal question. We're going we're gonna to set that aside. 
Um, and now he's come up with a second motion um, to direct administration to come back. Um, and we are in to come back with some parameters, correct, Savian? Yeah. So now we are in a discussion part of that motion. Um, Sherry has come forth and said that we are, that it, she's not, he's not able to make that motion um, according to what he stated. Um, and so we're trying to figure out the appropriate language so that we can have a, a conversation. I think that we will have a conversation about the 30 day, but I don't think that this is part of the motion uh, that Savion is referring to right now. I have a legal quick, quick clarification. May I ask? Go ahead, Nikki. Under um, the statute on 118, um, uh, on termination versus layoff, if I look at uh, Dodge County Professional Employees, got to the appeals court 2013 said, given the hold of this case, a court could hold that a non-renewal constitutes a dismissal or a termination subject to the statutory grievance process. By that logic, technically, we could be saying that we could open ourselves up to litigation if we do that, because te because technically we're saying that you we are not going to renew you. There's a difference between financial renewal of a contract and statutory uh, and the contract for non-performance due to the statute. We're discussing the non-performance statute or the financial statute or both. We, we were just, I think what Deirdre was referring to was what is specifically in the handbook. The handbook does not give us the opportunity to lay someone off. The only opportunity is it to wait and go through the non-renewal process. Now that may be an error in the handbook, but that's what we have right now. And that's what she was addressing is the fact that the handbook gives us one option to wait until the non-renewal period and at that time, all the layoffs, even if they were retro back to September, we would have to wait until April in the spring to do it. Okay, we are not gonna get a, a resolution on the 30 day right now. I think Savion's motion is, um, does include um, a conversation amongst staff and administration on that part. Uh, Chris, you have been patiently waiting so um, I want to just say about the 30 days, first of all, um, we do not have a budget crisis right now. Secondly, if we end up with an enrollment crisis, the surplus process, my understanding is the surplus process will kick in and staff will get surplus. Um, so we may not need layoff, we may need to deal with the surplus issue. Um, I. I can't imagine working for an organization where my job security was 30 days. Even though we're saying out loud at this board meeting that we would only use this in a crisis, there's nothing going into the handbook that would say we would only use this into a crisis. And therefore, the only way I could see supporting any kind of 30-day language that went into the handbook was to make it very clear that that language would only kick into effect if there was a funding loss, a significant funding loss that impacted our ability to pay teachers. And if the board approved, like by a vote, letting that 30 day layoff notice kick into effect. Just putting 30 day layoff into the handbook means that arbitrarily we can lay people off. And you know we can say whatever we want at this meeting, but the language that's going into the handbook does not say that that 30 day notice will only kick in in the event of a funding loss. And therefore, I think it needs to go and we need to rethink how we handle funding loss as a district. And if we're dealing with enrollment loss, then um, we're looking at the surplus process. Is my understanding. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Chris. I'm sorry, were you done? Yeah, thank you, Chris. I think um, great, great points. I agree. Um, I think, um, you know, we are make we are setting, we are setting these policies based on um, I think we are moving now towards a conversation on um, a budget deficit, right? And having issues around that. And I, I, I never agree with making these policies um, 
based on that, right? I mean, I think that if we do um, incorporate this, it, that ha the language has to be uh, put into the handbook, right? That we are going to win under circumstances, there's a budget deficit um, that we move into this uh, part of a layoff process, right? Um, and this, is, this process will, will play a part in it, but I think just, you know, putting it out there, I think it really is, um, it feels uneasy for me to even think about just a natural, a regular 30 day um, notice on this. And um, so Savion, I think I, I want us to move back to your motion here. So can you reread your motion so that we can move on and, and vote? Yeah. So I've I furthermore moved that the Board of Education direct the superintendent to direct the handbook committee to continue meeting on the proposed handbook provisions on teacher surplus, unilateral reassignment, layoff, and hiring in the support units with a deadline of the November regular Board of Education meeting. Should the district experience significant funding loss due to state budget cuts, the board may move up the deadline for bringing forward this proposal no later than the November regular uh, Board of Education board meeting with the following directives that the handbook review committee should develop a rubric or other objective evaluation tool that will be added to the handbook, an appeals process for layoff or develop an appeals process that will provide representation for teachers selected for layoff and remove the 30 day layoff notice. Second. Nikki second. All right. So um, are we prepared to move into a vote here? Yes. Can Julie, I just what? clarify again with Sherry that we don't need to vote on this. Yeah, we, you can just yeah. direct me to do it. I would like. That is, I mean, the force is the, the same. Act, actually, to me, board I know, Nikki, through. you'd rather have it voted on. I get it. But what I'm saying is this is bad practice. If you want to have it voted on, fine. But yeah. it's better to just give her the directive to do it. She's your employee. She will like have to go and do it. I understand that. But I think for clarity's sake, I want to vote on it. I think that shows, and, it, and I think it shows that the board speaks when it acts, when it votes. That's and I think opinion. it shows that you don't trust Jane. That she would I, do that I you think direct. Trust has nothing so, to do with it. I believe in go it ahead. having written. You can vote, Jen. You can vote on it, Nikki, if the chair acknowledges that she wants to vote on it. That's Nikki, fine. And sh um, thank you, Sherry, for for your guidance on this. We're going to go ahead and vote. Uh, Deirdre, your um, or I'm sorry, Deirdre, did you have something? Because you came up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just want to resurface the concern about the removal. There is specific language talking about the removal of the 30 day notice. And I'm not sure that the board quite understands what that means. You're, you are losing your flexibility and your options. And so I'm just going to speak about it and, and, and I'm going to be done. But I think it is, it is not the the right move. I don't think you should be removing that. I think if you want for us to have a discussion about 30 day notice, and if you want us to come back and bring different language, but to say that you are going to remove it and not have it be something that is considered is a great mistake. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, Gloria, can I jump in quick? Chris, go ahead. Question. Thank you. Um, First of all, I actually think we should vote on this because it sends a strong message to the community that we as a board are taking a strong stance on equity and that we as a board are not okay with the status quo and we are directing the superintendent to move forward on coming up with something better. Um, secondly, I would be comfortable with um, changing the 30 day language notice to say, just add the words as written at the end of it. So we're, we're um, saying that you need to change the 30 day language as written um, and as part of the consensus process, you can come back to us with something different. We may not agree with you. We may send you back to the table, but I'd be okay with as written being added. Avian, can you add that to your motion? And so we can go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, that's cool. Point of order. Out of confusion, I don't know which um, one that um, we are voting on. Uh, additionally, on I'm just going to say that I'm sorry, but I I cannot vote for this as much as I respect you, Sabian. I can't have the 30 days in there. My 
that's something that I, I just cannot do. Okay, well, Nikki, Nikki, can I clarify that? What we're not saying 30 days will be in there. What we're saying is that this motion states that we're directing the superintendent to direct the handbook committee to continue meeting. And in the process of continuing to meet, three things we want them to take into account are that the rubric has to be made together and live in the handbook, that the appeals sure. process needs to be rethought and needs to include staff voice, and that we do not want to include the 30-day notice as written. It doesn't say oh, that the 30-day okay. notice will be included. It says we, we do not want it to be included then as written. I couldn't written. hear right, and I apologize. Fabian, does that sum up what you wrote correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so where are we at on process? So we got um, that um, language in there as written. Okay. Nikki, do you second that? I second now. Okay. All right. Are we all ready for a vote? I think so. Okay, Julia, your advisory vote? Aye. Okay, all those in favor, aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed? I'm going to abstain from the vote just because I think that the the process was a bit confusing. And I think if we're staying in conversation um, around around it, I don't know what action the vote actually informs other than we're returning to the negotiating table. So that's my abstention. OK. Six uh, it sounds like um, six. Um, it's six called. zero one one abstention one abstention. so motion passes all right and uh, now that was the last thing on our agenda can i get a motion to adjourn so moved so second moved. Ali, nikki second, uh, second. Julia. julia your advisory vote aye Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good.